Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for logging on for this webinar, Business or Pleasure, Advanced B Visas, and the Visa Waiver Program. Today, I'm going to talk about the ESTA program and the requirements for it, the Electronic System for Travel Authorization. Um, I'm going to talk about the various subtypes of B Visas, but first I'm going to go into a discussion of some of the more commonly asked questions about the two types of programs um, and kind of give a little bit of a background um, in that way. Last year, this webinar focused primarily on the business type of subsets for the B program. I'm still going to talk about those and others not previously covered, but this time I want to also bring in more of the discussion about the family-based um, B2 or visa waiver tourist based types of entries especially as they pertain to individuals who then want to try to adjust status or maybe have an immigrant visa pending. By way of delayed introduction my name is Joseph Shepard I am an associate attorney at the firm in the Santa Monica office um, I handle both family-based and employment-based immigrant and non-immigrant visas, as well as employer compliance issues, um, certification for attendance by international students for schools, and I am not very tech savvy, so some window just popped up that I'm going to have to do, try to deal with. Um, so bear with me while that happens. Um, nonetheless, uh, let's begin and let me know if you have any questions. Oh yeah, speaking of the questions, uh, on your side panel you should be able to enter in the uh, questions and then at the end of the session I will go through and answer as many of them as I can. Um, so just so you know, there will be no um, on-air uh, question and answer session. I'll be reading them and then answering them. So, and we'll start with the ESTA program. The ESTA program is reserved specifically for Nationals of countries the U.S. has determined uh, to have very low visa denial rates. Uh, this is specifically, um, list. there's about a list of 37 or so countries that qualify for participation in the ESTA program, uh, Chile being the most recent re-addition um, to this list. Um, the countries come from Europe, Asia, Eastern and Western Europe, South America, uh, some Middle East. Um, the actual list is available on the Department of State's website, um, but nonetheless, that is one of the key factors to be able to be eligible to participate in the ESTA program. Um, individuals who apply for ESTA certification are, or rather will be permitted to enter the U.S. for 90 days at a time for business or pleasure. Um, they have to have a machine-readable passport, and um, the airline upon which they are entering the U.S. has to be a Visa Waiver Program signatory character. As most of you know, the Department of Customs and Border Protection, CBP, has instituted a paperless I-94 system. That means that instead of issuing every single time that you enter a paper I-94 with your name, handwritten on it, etc., and a stamp and the date that you're allowed to remain until. They will now issue this electronically and this record is created electronically based on the itinerary of your flight. So if you're entering the U.S. via air, this will be created by CBP based on the flight manifest. If you're entering the U.S. via land, uh, most likely that will have to either be data entry um, put into the system um, but we'll talk about that momentarily whenever we talk about the travel uh, perks and restrictions with ESTA. In addition, um, the person entering the U.S. or intending to enter the U.S. on the ESTA program has to be able to have a return ticket onward um, outside of the U.S. and not to a contiguous territory and uh, not to an adjacent island. In general, the application process is fairly straightforward. Um, you fill out an application online at Customs and Border Protection's website. It's fairly easy to use. It's fairly inexpensive. 
Um, the limitations on travel that I mentioned uh, just, just a couple minutes ago really um, facilitate, or at least it's meant to facilitate, travel in the NAFTA region for individuals coming from overseas. So, um, but at the same time, it, it limits your stay uh, to the U.S. after that initial entry from overseas to a 90-day period. So if you are entering the U.S., say, from um, Chile, and you're, you came in on January 1st, uh, you wanted to go to Canada for maybe two weeks, um, that two, whenever you spend your two weeks in Canada and re-enter the U.S., um, you're still actually within that 90-day period from your first entry there. So it's not it's not like you're getting another admission into uh, the U.S. in another 90-day period. Um, that's something to consider. Even if you're flying from the U.S. to Canada for that short period trip, um, you will not be getting a whole new entry. Uh, con one important consideration there is, too, since you're also likely not getting the paper I-94 um, explicitly telling you this upon each entry and exit, um, it's up to you to ensure you're keeping track of your 90 days. And the Customs and Border Protection website has a new handy tool that makes that possible on their website um, that provides not just your quote-unquote electronic I-94 record, which now replaces the paper version, but also your travel history. So every time that you or your passport <clears throat> or <laughs> someone using your passport, just kidding, trigger the system, it will show up there as your date of arrival and departure and the port of entry and port of departure. So every time that you've flown using that machine-readable passport on ESTA, for example, and you suddenly find yourself in a situation where you have to document all your trips to and from the U.S., a very handy tool is to log on to the CBP website and access what they have, at least, as your itinerary. It's not always perfect. It's not always all-inclusive. Sometimes it's strangely over-inclusive. Nonetheless, it's up to you to go through and document and double-check and make sure it's right. If you have any questions about that, feel free to let me know. Off-topic, um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about that during this session. A brief overview of the B-1 and B-2 visa. Um, these are specifically visas that are endorsed folio style into your passport. Um, this is for individuals who are coming to the U.S. Um, for business or pleasure, obviously, but then there's plenty of different subsets of what those two things mean. It's also not just for individuals who don't live in a visa waiver eligible country. Uh, people in those countries who either have a very specific purpose for which they're coming and require admission to the U.S. for longer than 90 days or require or desire the flexibility of being able to extend their non-immigrant status in the U.S. or extend their trip beyond those 90 days, um, will be eligible to apply for a B-1, B-2 visa. Also, individuals under the ESTA program who've ever had denied entry or been removed from the U.S. or are no longer eligible for ESTA have to apply for one of these visas. Um, the requirements for Applying for a B-1 and B-2 visa vary greatly depending on specifically why you're applying for it. The most common type of, uh, or rather the general form of the visa, unless you specify otherwise, is just the B-1 slash 2. Uh, for most countries, that is going to be a 10-year visa. Uh, sometimes it can be shorter depending on which country you're in and the agreements we have with your country for reciprocity. Um, but you don't have to just get the general B-1, B-2 visa, and we'll go into visa annotations um, in a little bit. Um, before we do as well, I also wanted to mention um, very briefly the new types of, or rather new as of, as of this presentation since last year, the types of specific subsets we're going to discuss later on, and that is the B-2 fiancé of a U.S. citizen, and the B-2 fiancé of a non-immigrant currently in the U.S. Um, I kind of spoil it a little bit with those explanations, but as you'll see later, uh, we'll get into the details. So, for both ESTA entry and entry pursuant to a B-1 or B-2 visa, or B-1, B-2 visa, 
Um, everyone has to have non-immigrant intent. What does that mean? That means that they have to have the intent to depart the U.S. and return to a residence they have abroad. They have a no intent of abandoning. Um, they specifically and explicitly cannot have a, a, a primary intent to remain in the U.S. permanently and with specificity, especially this trip. So if you have a individual who enters on ESTA and at, or rather attempts to enter on ESTA and the Customs and Border Patrol officer who inspects them at the airport um, asks, so what are you coming for? Oh, I'm coming for, you know, to visit some friends and then a, adjust status to permanent resident um, after I marry my uh, secret fiance. And, you know, that, that right there is an explicit and direct expression of your primary immigrant intent. Um, now, the difference between primary intent and kind of a secondary intent or immigrant intent, non-immigrant intent, um, these, these lines can be blurry and gray, and sometimes it's hard for individuals to articulate um, properly you know, why they're coming in. Um, if you're coming into the U.S. for anything other than simple business meetings or pleasure, tourism, vacation, um, chances are you're going to have to learn how to describe this and be prepared how to demonstrate uh, that you have a residence abroad, you have no intents of abandoning, uh, and that you have um, no immediate intent to, once you're in the U.S., adjust status to permanent residence. And I'll explain the, the specific um, definition of adjustment in just a moment. Um, but along the way, um, some general principles to consider as we go through this um, and kind of summarizing Entries made through the Visa Waiver Program, or ESTA, are limited to 90 days. That is a, a pretty hard and fast rule. There aren't really flexibilities there for you to extend even further. There's a very, very limited exception for emergencies uh, under ESTA. Uh, it's a, a, a process that will likely involve the, the inclusion of an attor attorney or someone who um, can direct you to an attorney. Uh, these are very complicated types of applications and um, you, it requires a discretionary grant of approval from a USCIS director. Um, as to entries must depart the US in 90 days, right, right, right. Um, people who overstay an as to entry often will find themselves in the US and asking the question later, well, now I want to, you know, become a permanent resident, or now I want to do this. Uh, well, the answer is you can't. Um, there are very, very limited exceptions upon which USCIS has the discretion to, to forgive a visa waiver uh, overstay, but for all intents and purposes, it's 90 days, and that's it. For the B1, B2, however, um, you're allowed entry for up to six months, and in some types of the subsets, up to a year. So whenever you present your, your visa at the border to Customs and Border Patrol and sufficiently explain to them the purpose of your visit and are, are able to articulate your non-immigrant intent, um, you can potentially get up to a year. Uh, most of the categories are limited to six months at a time. But the best part about these are that they're extendable. It's not a hard and fast rule that it's only an emergency exception. No, it's an application that you submit to extend your non-immigrant status. You have to, again, demonstrate your non-immigrant intent. So, you know, if you're doing a 10th year extension of a B from within the U.S., you better have a really good reason why, because it looks like you might have abandoned that residence uh, you have abroad, or at least should still have abroad. Um, so, you know, the B1, B2 is preferable for individuals who are coming to the U.S. for maybe one longer length of time um, in general, or want the flexibility of being able to stay for that longer period of time, um, versus visa waiver, which is more for very potentially frequent, but 
very short trips. Um, there is no changing status from ESTA to other categories. Uh, for example, if you're here on Visa Waiver and you want to become an O1 um, movie star, just saying. If that's the case, um, you're not going to be able to change status from within the U.S. to become an O1. You're going to have to depart the U.S. and then apply for an O-1 visa abroad and then come back. Um, similarly, though, on the B-1, B-2, if you're here and you want to change to another non-immigrant status, depending on what that non-immigrant status is, it's potentially possible. Um, if you entered on B-1, B-2 and want to become an O-1 movie star um, and you have a, a petition filed for you by an O-1 employer or agent um, and you can demonstrate um, that you haven't violated your status before that change, then you can then you don't have to leave the U.S. before you can become that O1 movie star. However, um, if you're in, entered in B1 or B2 and you want to become a student, you want to change to an F1 student or something similar, there's many more complex rules involved. Uh, for those types of individuals, just for the for a general guideline. If your intent upon entry is to, you know, come look at schools and then change to an F1 student visa while you're in the U.S., um, that's not permissible. They're not going to allow that. Uh, but if you came in, say, on vacation, something happened that made you want to stay, and then, you know, and you can prove this, basically, that you want to change to that status, but you didn't intend to do so upon that initial entry, um, that kind of change of status to F1 is permitted. So, like I said, there's lots of different complexities involved in these, but that's just one example. Uh, if you have a specific situation in mind or, you know, have a client who is facing a, a, a tight situation like this and you're wondering whether or not it's possible to change, um, please definitely give us a call or email and we can, we can help, you know, kind of parse out the details. Um, so like I said about the immigrant intent, you have to prove you have that residence abroad, you have no intent of abandoning, um, that you do not intend to permanently remain in the U.S. upon this entry, specifically that your primary intent upon this entry is not to gain permanent residence in the U.S. Um, or just remain here without a status. Um, so there's kind of some things that you can think about uh, in terms of either evidence that you present or physical things that you do. Um, that would be indicative of someone who doesn't have that immigrant intent. Uh, sometimes, you know, immigration officers might be having a bad day and they feel like everyone is filled with immigrant intent. Um, even if you don't and you would have you no know, other indication that you have such an intent, uh, ways to kind of, you know, conservatively prepare, you know, expect the best, prepare for the worst, um, would be to always have that return ticket home with you. Um, purchase it, get it, get your non-refundable ticket, bring that stub with you or that flight itinerary printout with you, um, showing that it's paid for when and where it's leaving. Um, you know, think about being able to demonstrate your family and social ties in your home country. Or if you have a job in your home country and you are given specific leave from that job to come to the U.S. for whatever purpose you're coming for. So a lot of people who come to the U.S., under either ESTA or B-1 business, um, you know, are familiar with the idea of an invitation letter from the U.S. side, but maybe don't always remember to, uh, to think about the invita or excuse me, the letter on the other side, the letter from the employer saying, yes, this person is an employee of our company. Uh, they are on leave from date X to date Y. We expect them back to work in our offices at blah, 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 address on date Z. Um, attach to please find a copy of their pay record. Those are the types of things, especially for frequent business travelers um, or even people who are coming to the U.S. for medical reasons in B-2 or as a fiancé as a B-2 and then are going to return back home abroad, don't necessarily always have with them. But they are things that CBP um, would, <laughs> would be helpful for them to see uh, to help establish that you have those strong ties in your home country. Um, you know, if you don't have a position or employment like that, um, but say you have close friends or family or relatives or roommates or a dog or, you know, 
I have to pick up my dog from daycare at date, you know, B uh, on this date. So I'm absolutely going home. Um, these are also true, not just when you have an officer who's having a bad day, but say you have something potentially in your, in your file that would maybe make an officer, everything else being equal, think that you could have immigrant intent. For example, if you had a pending I-130 petition for you, or you had a pending I-140 petition for you, and you're not, um, you know, you're not traditionally employed in the U.S., but you maybe want to be. If they see that in their system, and these days they can and likely will, um, that might be a big red flag that you have immigrant intent to them. Or if you're traveling with, say, a laptop and, you know, Customs Border Protection or the officer who's searching your, your things comes across, you know, all of your letters or emails and photos with your secret fiancé that you're coming to the U.S. to secretly visit, oh, that's a huge indication of immigrant intent. But you know what? Even if, even if that's not your intent to stay in the U.S., get married and adjust status or come into the U.S. and adjust status um, and have that immigrant intent, that could be inferred. So think about, think about prevent, preventing those kind of things from happening or those bad calls from happening um, by doing the things on this list you know, showing that you have the bank account statements there. Um, that, you know, like I said about the invitation letter, that you're coming to engage in that lawful purpose for which the either visa was issued or is permissible under the ESTA or the visa category. Some other issues just to consider and remember, you know, every time that you enter the U.S., um, you are not just clearing immigration, immigration considers it to be an application for admission. So just because you have ESTA certification does not guarantee admission to the U.S., you're applying for it every time. And the, the decision maker is that Customs and Border Protection Officer. Um, if you have any ground, if you're inadmissible to the U.S. under any grounds, be it criminal, be it previous uh, removal from the U.S. or prior visa overstays, health-related reasons or fraud or misrepresentation, those things can come up and likely will um, at the border. Just because it hasn't come up before doesn't mean it will. Um, you know, basically from 2007 onward, we've seen increasingly and exponentially so in some ways um, the access of electronic information and records even with previous records that were not electronic, but now are, um, not just in the U.S., but also in countries that the U.S. has information sharing agreements with. Uh, one little known fact about the proposed immigration reform that was passed by the Senate last year, uh, but not the House, it contained a provision to amend the rules for um, participation in ESTA, and it was not just no, tied to having visa uh, B1, B2 visa denial rates below a certain number. It also included, you know, having the country's participation was slated or rather conditioned upon also having low overstay rates. Since now everything is electronic, they have that information. So it became possible and, um, excuse me, it became possible and um, easy to implement if that legislation was enacted. They also tied to it um, kind of a discretionary line. If it was slightly over those uh, specific rates for overstaying, um, excuse me, if the visa denial rates for a certain country were over the, the percentage required or the overstay rates were over the percentage required by a slight margin, say, between 5% um, to 10% or 5% to 7%, uh, the... U.S. government had the discretion then to take into, into account things like whether or not we have information sharing agreements with that country. So it was, it was rather kind of an, um, an exception to get out of being excluded from the visa waiver program as a whole country um, if we share information. You know, anecdotal evidence and, you know, non-scientific research thus far, at least non-published, into the information sharing agreements, um, agreements between the countries that participate in visa waiver 
and um, but excuse me, the countries that participate in visa waiver in the U.S. indicate that lots of these countries are on that list or are in the process of um, implementing those types of agreements. So far, you know, Germany, U.K., Australia, um, Netherlands, South Korea, and more as time goes on are implementing these information sharing agreements. So if you ever had an immigration violation in the UK or Australia, chances are it's going to be in the system in the US side as well. Um, I bring all these things up just as the, it, it, under the giant umbrella of other issues, uh, but there's one more that I want to add to this, is that if you've ever been previously denied entry, summary denial of entry, under the visa waiver program. It's come up with some frequency, especially after the um, decision last summer to strike down the Defense of Marriage Act, where there are plenty of individuals now who could be eligible to apply to adjust status to permanent resident, or otherwise you're just curious about, well, what if I was previously denied entry under the visa waiver program? Um, does that count as a removal, quote unquote, for purposes of applying for uh, any immigration benefits in or to the U.S.? So the answer is no. It does not specifically um, constitute the equivalent of a removal under the Immigration Nationality Act, uh, Section 240, uh, which would result otherwise in a 10-year bar to being readmitted. So that is just specifically being denied entry. If you're in the U.S., and you're, say, an overstay in visa waiver, or you're in the U.S. on visa waiver and you commit some crime, that would trigger the summary removal proceedings um, under Section 217, uh, the section that deals with the visa waiver program. That would be considered equivalent to removal, and that would result in a 10-year bar to being readmitted. Um, that's important for a number of reasons. Um, but there is a difference between being summer, excuse me, summarily denied entry under the uh, ESTA or Visa Waiver Program, you know, at the airport and put right back on the plane, and there's and the um, being removed under the Visa Waiver Program expedited removal um, type of situation that would trigger um, the equivalent of a removal order. Nonetheless, even if you've ever been uh, denied entry under the ESTA program or removed under the ESTA program, you're no longer eligible to participate in the ESTA program, and you have to apply for a visa. Um, you know, this is, with the, with the removal from, excuse me, with being denied entry to the U.S. under ESTA, while that does not explicitly require, within one step, having to um, you know, no longer be eligible. If you have any um, changes, if there are any material changes to your situation after you are ESTA certified, um, including if you've ever been denied entry, you have to immediately update your ESTA certification. You have to log on to the website and make the change and hit send and it has to be decided again. Well, if that happens, one of the questions on the ESTA application specifically asks, uh, you know, whether or not, let me see the, the exact wording so I don't get it wrong. So question, one of the questions is whether the applicant has ever been denied entry to the U.S. Um, and if so, you have to answer yes. And if you have uh, ever answered yes, um, it's unlikely to be approved for entry and you'll be forced to pursue the visa of the consulate. And then, interestingly enough, too, the Department of State um, has, on their fantastic n newly redesigned website, this similar information that um, the only cure, basically, is to apply for a visa at that point. So, be it a removal under the visa waiver program or um, denied entry under the visa waiver program, you no longer can use the Visa Waiver Program. If you were removed pursuant to the Visa Waiver Program from within the U.S. for a deportable offense, you do trigger uh, that 10-year bar that comes with the removal. Um, but also, importantly, as we'll, we'll see in just a moment, when we start talking about 
adjustment of status uh, from either visa waiver or from a B1, B2 visa. Uh, an overstay on visa waiver can make things very complicated. So you're in the U.S. in ESTA or you're in the U.S. on, on a B1, B2 and you want to do something else. Something else changes uh, since you entered. Uh, and I want to just clarify a few definitions first. You know, an admission is the process by which a person obtains a visa, who obtained a visa, um, or um, has ESTA, is, is admitted to the U.S. An admission means you enter a status. You can be physically in the U.S. and enter a new status. Um, so, for example, if you're in the U.S., and you adjust status to permanent resident, um, that will be considered an admission. An extension refers to the continuation of the same status. Um, so since visa waiver is not a visa uh, and there's no extensions necessary, that definition doesn't apply. But if you're on a B1, B2 and you seek to continue in that B1, B2 uh, to remain in the U.S., then that would be called an extension of your status. Uh, a change of status uh, differs slightly in that you, it's not mutually exclusive, by the way, with extension, but you're changing, you're switching to uh, one visa category or one visa classification to a second from B, B to O, like my prior example, or B to F, like another example. Um, similarly, within that alphabet soup uh, category, so if you're changing from a B, oh, excuse me, if you're changing from an F1 to an F2 or vice versa, those types of uh, things are called changes of status, and they can be done uh, with or without a, a request for an extension as well. Like I said, no extensions for ESTA. All must depart. Um, and there's that limited exception. I wondered where that slide went. Uh, the B visa admission. Um, even though you apply for, let's say you applied for one of the subsets that we'll get into in a moment for the B1, uh, and you wanted to extend that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, even though then you have that visa and then you want to come to the U.S., every single time you come to the U.S., even though you have that visa, it's not guaranteed, so you have to make your case again. So likely if you retain an, an immigration attorney who helped you apply for that specific subset of B1, B2, and they provided you with a packet of documents uh, that was given to the embassy or consulate in connection with that application. Uh, there's a courtesy copy probably somewhere for you um, and probably a back pocket cover letter either from the attorney or maybe the person who invited you to the U.S. or your employer back um, in your home country or your uh, spouse, fiance, or what have you. Um, to be submitted only if requested. So you can explain your situation, make sure you can articulate those things um, clearly to the officer um, in order to have your application for admission to the U.S. pursuant to that visa approved each time. Um, even if there's an annotation on the visa, uh, which I'm not going to specifically cover with a slide, but just to give you a background, you can specifically request when applying for a B1 or B2 or B1-2 visa that the officer annotate. Um, CBP loves a good annotation because it makes it clear that this courtesy copy that you have of the visa application or what you're saying is the visa application, uh, it makes it more likely than before or, or more likely than not true um, if it's annotated correctly. Uh, the the consulate or embassy to which you're applying um, should really accept these requests for uh, annotating the visa and you should make sure that it's annotated properly uh, because sometimes maybe new officers aren't directly familiar with the annotation process. You applied for a U.S. Uh, or rather a fiancé visa of a U.S. citizen and you got a visa that was annotated fiancé of a non-immigrant. Um, there are differences, and, and if you're coming to do one thing versus another, that, that could be big problems. Um, so you want to make sure once you get your visa that you really do check and make sure the annotation is correct. Um, I will come back to that a little later on when I talk about the specific subsets. Uh, let's see. 
the the nuts and bolts of applying for an extension or change of status um, are you file with USCIS with form I-539 um, and it must be filed before the expiration date of your previous B status. So if you enter and you got six months and that six months expires June 30th, uh, USCIS must receive, not that you mail, but they must receive the form I-539 application for extension or change of non-immigrant status on or before that day. So on June 30th is the very last day that they can accept it. But for some of you who have maybe been familiar with this process or know someone who has or are just keen on current adjudication trends at USCIS or processing times, those are taking not just five months now, but sometimes six months or even longer. Um, it's absolutely absurd, especially if there was a request for evidence. This means that, well, what do you do if your extension is still pending? You only ask for six months. When they approve it, they likely will only approve it for those six months. Um, and that date has passed. Well, one potential solution there is to e-file the next application on or before that date um, or file that uh, 539 with USCIS before that date with evidence that the last one was still pending so that if they then you know, try to argue, well, then you came out of status, you timely filed the next extension with that um, and are piggybacking off of the um, egregiously delayed previous application. Um, just a small anecdote. Um, not to beat a dead horse, then I'm going to move on a little bit so we can keep going and get into some examples. Just um, then recap, right? Um, this kind of summarizes everything I just said in a nutshell. So um, the topic that I wanted to get to next is um, adjustment of status. Individuals who are in the U.S. inside the U.S. This does not even necessarily mean that they are in some affirmative status. Um, it is possible in some circumstances to be able to adjust status to that of a permanent resident or, you know, you basically enter the U.S. That is a new admission to the U.S. Um, you ad are admitted into this new status. You can be inside the U.S., um, you can be at the border of the U.S. Uh, physically, but for legal purposes, you are being admitted or entering or adjusting your status to that of a permanent resident or green card holder. The key difference here is that you don't have to go outside of the U.S., apply for and receive as a folio in your passport an immigrant visa, and then seek reentry to the U.S. from the border. Uh, you get to stay in the U.S., you apply with USCIS to adjust. So that's the key difference between change and adjust. You're here in ESTA, there is no change of status. Uh, but if you're here in ESTA, in general, there's no adjustment of status except for uh, some limited circumstances, which we'll talk about in a second. If you're here on a B1, B2, there is adjustment of status and there is change of status. Um, go to town as long as you qualify for it. The kind of comparison of the two and what is permitted and what is not. Um, ESTA entrants are ineligible to adjust except for, say, your spouse filed an immigrant uh, visa petition for you, an I-130 petition. Um, we'll get into the before or after 90-day period in just a minute. Adjustment of status is permitted in the B context, not just for the family-based I-130 petitions, but also for the I-140 petitions. Um, and in some cases, there's also EB-5 adjustments permitted. Uh, there's more flexibility in terms of the scale I-130 to I-140 to the EB-5-based adjustments uh, in that the I-140 um, has some exceptions if you've ever been out of status. Um, the I-130 is similar, but those for immediate relatives, a.k.a. Um, spouses, parents, and children, and the children means uh, that they are under 21, excuse me, um, those are allowed to adjust immediately and don't have the same restrictions that an I-140 does. And similarly, um, the exceptions that are permitted to an I-140 
uh, do not apply to the investment-based ones. Um, but strictly speaking, think of it like this. Um, if you're here in ESTA, you pretty much just have to leave after 90 days. But let's say you entered in ESTA and you fell in love and met someone and married someone and you decided you wanted to then apply for adjustment of status. Um, whether or not you can do so, well, USCIS recently just published a policy memo kind of clarifying their position on point. Um, this document basically states that, um, yeah, you can apply to adjust status um, based on an immediate relative petition, but just like everything else in the adjustment of status context, context there is still a level of discretion. This policy memo kind of points USAIS and outlines exactly what they can and can't do in that regard. And if there's a, a visa waiver entrant um, who has been ordered removed, say, you know, they entered 10 years ago or 9 years ago and, you know, were given an order to leave under the visa waiver program, but they never did, um, then, if they apply to adjust status, though, from within the U.S., you know, come out of the shadows and try to apply, USCIS um, is allowed to actually have that order executed or hand the case over to ICE um, to issue an order like that if there isn't one. So, if there's anything in your record and your visa waiver overstay and there's anything in your record like that, um, you need to speak with a qualified immigration attorney before doing anything like applying for adjustment of status because you may actually trigger a worse situation uh, than you have now, and likely, um, you know, the decision by USCIS in those cases to hand over such um, a file to ICE um, and ICE's issuance of that um, removal order under a visa waiver can happen very quickly. Uh, strictly speaking, when we went over the uh, benefits of the ESTA program, if the worst occurs and um, you know, for some reason there are criminal charges or, you know, there's a, any criminal activity whatsoever, just as an example, um, this can trigger ICE to order that order of removal. Uh, if you're under visa waiver, if you're removed pursuant to visa waiver, there is no getting in front of an immigration judge and making your case. Whenever you apply for ESTA, whenever you filled out that application and paid your $14 for ESTA certification, um, you are waiving your rights, and it's in big, bold letters at the bottom of the online application, but just in case you didn't see it, you're waiving your right to being able to contest your eligibility for remaining in the U.S. or for making any claims to being able to remain in the U.S. Um, if, it, you know, if you're ordered removed, except for and only for to apply for asylum. So let's say you applied to adjust status from visa waiver, uh, based on an, an immediate relative petition filed for you, say by a spouse. Um, you were, though, a visa waiver overstay, and um, your case, for whatever reason, is denied. Uh, you don't necessarily get to go to the immigration court and make your case. Um, it is a very complex and new area of the law based on the... Um, kind of colliding interests of the USCIS policy memo that I mentioned. Um, there is a Ninth Circuit court of, U.S. Court of Appeals case on point that literally makes the situation uh, that I just described different for individuals who live in the western United States, California, Nevada, Arizona, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, um, etc. Those um, the situation is literally different, so it's, uh, it behooves anyone in the situation to contact Immigration Council um, in their district, in the district where you live, rather, federal court district, and make sure, or any immigration attorney who's familiar with that law, to, to, to make sure that you're not putting yourself at risk before you do anything like apply to adjust status because you heard they forgive everything. Um, another thing I want to kind of clarify is the previously um, emphasized 30-60 uh, 60, 60 day rule. The Department of State, you know, has a regulation 
um, in place, uh, which can lead any immigration officer to visa office to consider actions like changing or um, adjusting status or taking any action towards some other step within 30 or 60 days of the last uh, non-immigrant or immigrant step you just took to be a fraud indicator. USCIS, um, in practice, um, you know, there, there's, no, there's nothing that they can rely upon to make this a rule. Um, since it's all discretionary, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a consideration, but it is not a requirement. Um, that, though, being said, if you have any questions, please contact uh, an immigration attorney about it. Um, I do just want to clarify that um, although the 30-60 day rule is something that the Department of State um, holds true and enforces very regularly, um, the enforcement of that 30-60 day rule by USCIS, not so much. All uh, right. Um, to summarize, the business traveler, and that is, uh, this is going to be a very large summary compared to what I did last year on this topic. Um, no productive employment is permitted. What is productive employment? It's the facilitation of um, basically a product or a service. Are you performing services for an employer? Are you producing something that you're going to sell uh, or that your employer is going to sell or that the person who's paying you is going to sell? Uh, are you selling something to them? Are you doing something service-wise for someone that they're paying you for? The paying is not even that important. It's the fact that you're performing the service in the first place. Um, so if you're thinking about, uh, you know, well, well, can I volunteer? You can't work for free for something that you would otherwise be performing a product or a service. Uh, volunteer positions in the traditional sense of, say, you know, the... Uh, humanitarian or, um, for example, like Red Cross based, um, those types of traditional, quote unquote, you know, you know, humanitarian type of volunteering situations may be permissible uh, on a limited basis. But if you have a specific question like that, definitely contact an immigration attorney to get clarification. Um, you know, things that are okay on ESTA entry or a B1 entry uh, in the business kind of context, you know, business or pleasure. Um, there's attending conferences, there's um, commercial transactions um, that don't involve gainful employment. So, you know, negotiating contracts, setting up things for the eventual establishment of a business, uh, collecting in, in information in preparation of productive employment. For example, maybe going for an orientation session. And this really means orientation, like going through an employee manual um, or a presentation on something that you may have to do in the future. You're not allowed to do the work. You can't go for that specific work. If you're going for training um, and that training is to help facilitate your employment and position abroad to which you're absolutely returning to, sure. But if it's for, you know, more training-based activities for an eventual job in the U.S., not so much. Um, impermissible activities um, would be, you know, getting paid, um, consulting, um, carrying out the terms of a contract, except in the limited cases of um, NAFTA um, entries under the B1B2 context. Under NAFTA, um, there are certain permissible activities, say, that a Canadian coming in to facilitate after-sales services uh, for a contract for the sale of goods can do that someone from, say, Switzerland would not be able to do. Um, moral of the story is ask an attorney. Um, here are some of the subsets, uh, like that I mentioned. Um, you know, the academics and professors coming to do um, certain um, speeches or presentations. Uh, this is the training subset of the B1 that I mentioned previously, the B1 in lieu of H1, B, or H3, specifically the H3. Um, so this is for individuals who may be coming for a shorter term stay. Um, a longer term placement for a training like this should really be done on the H3 um, or, if appropriate, a J1. Um, but, um, you know, say that it's like a three-week training program um, that you're going to go through and you otherwise meet all the requirements of the H3 training, um, it may make sense to 
specifically apply for the B1 in lieu of H3 visa with that specific annotation that I mentioned before on the visa so that, you know, yes, you have the visa in your, in your passport, the folio stamp in there. When you get to CBP and you come with, you know, the binder of training materials you printed before you came or something similar, and they say, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You'll have that courtesy copy of what you gave to the embassy, plus you'll have the annotation on the visa, which is helpful evidence for them to make it more likely than not, or rather to help them believe and um, be convinced that it's more likely than not true that uh, you're coming in to do what you're saying you're doing. Now, I do want to focus a little bit more this time around uh, with the time we have left on the B2 subsets. So, um, individuals who are coming to the U.S. Uh, to receive medical treatment. There are plenty of places in the U.S. that provide medical treatment to individuals, and, you know, the U.S. is known worldwide for having the, some of the best healthcare facilities um, in the world. Uh, individuals who are coming to the U.S. to receive this type of medical treatment who are under the care of a doctor um, and are coming for that limited purpose and that's their, their intent, um, they're not, you know, coming in to secretly do something else and, and get medical treatment on the side. This is their primary intent for coming. Um, may apply for and have their visa annotated with the B2 medical annotation. This can also be extended. Uh, for example, if you're coming in for, say, uh, in vitro fertilization treatments, if you're coming in for, say, um, a mental health retreat, um, if you're coming in for um, just specific treatment, maybe for a cancer treatment or a developmental treatment, literally there's, uh, there's not much limitation uh, in terms of what you can receive treatment for. That being said, you also want to make sure that the B2 medical visa application itself, the treatment you're coming for, and um, the treatment you receive while here do not impact your ability later on down the line um, or even to come in again or even remain in the U.S. Um, based on one of the grounds of inadmissibility for health reasons. You know, if you have a disease that is considered a, quote-unquote, public uh, uh, of public health significance, uh, end quote, and you are coming into the U.S. to try to receive treatment for it, um, you may have some complications and you may need to speak with an attorney. Um, you don't want to try to do these things necessarily with the ESTA um, unless you have already spoken with an immigration attorney and have something prepared upon your entry because if you get, again, denied entry on ESTA um, and your ability to use ESTA is over and you're going to have to apply for a visa anyway if you want to come back. Similarly, a denial of entry on a visa, um, you have to report these things every time you apply for immigration benefits, including um, upon an entry or upon an ESTA cert recertification or a visa application or an adjustment of status application, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, you know, it's not, being denied entry to the U.S. is not a small deal. Um, one thing, too, to, to keep in mind is that you may be permitted to withdraw your application for admission if things aren't going well. That being said, though, um, I'm going to hold until the end because I want to speak of this other subcategory, B2, uh, fiancés of U.S. citizens and fiancés of non-immigrants in the U.S. Individuals who are engaged to U.S. citizens uh, who are outside the U.S., right? I'm sure if you're in that situation, you've already heard about the K-1 visa, um, the K-1 and how long it takes. The K-1 visa process is not a quick process, and between long delays at USCIS um, that can stretch anywhere from five to eight months, uh, or um, at the U.S. Department of State, which can stretch anywhere from another five to eight months to well over a year um, to maybe even two years, depending on the post and depending on uh, the particulars of the case. That's a long time to be separated from the person that you uh, love. Without a K-1 visa uh, petition pending for you, you, or even maybe with one, you can apply for 
a B2 fiance of a US citizen visa specifically with the, that specific annotation. Similarly, so you have the packet you give to the officer at the time of the interview. Um, you request that specific annotation. You have that annotation on the visa. When you come to the US, remember it's not over. You bring that packet again with you to make the case again every time you come in. Um, but the most important thing here is that you're not just coming in to stay. You are allowed to come in then to visit. You are coming in specifically to do things um, or to visit with your your fiance, um, but you still have that non-immigrant intent. You still have a job, say, back home that you're going back to. You have your, your whole life there. You know, maybe you have that um, longer term abstract intent to do the immigrant visa or fiance visa process, the K-1, to come into the U.S. Uh, to be with them. But that doesn't, um, on this specific trip, you're not staying in the U.S. You can't stay in the U.S. You know, um, if you enter on this visa and you prepared all this application material stating your non-immigrant intent and your intent to go home afterwards, um, and then you actually do try to stay when you come in, well, while there's, you know, like I said before, that 30, 60 day rule, uh, for example, may not be an automatic trigger of denial or a fraud indicator necessarily, but that would, this one would be a huge fraud indicator. You literally said you're coming in and you're going to leave. You did that again when you applied for the specific entry after you got the visa, and then you're here and you try to adjust. Um, I, if I were a USCIS officer, uh, I would have problems with that, and USCIS officers would absolutely have problems with that. Um, it's a no-no. So the B-2 fiancé of a U.S. citizen specific annotated visa allows individuals who um, are either considering or haven't yet considered or even have one pending, even if you have a K-1 visa uh, uh, petition pending for you, it is possible to receive this B-2 um, if you can establish that non-immigrant intent. So the, what you put together for your application materials really matters in that situation. The last one of this subcategory, the B-2 fiancé of a non-immigrant in the U.S., um, you have to actually have the intent to come in and then you're following jo to join that, that non-immigrant um, fiancé. So you have a fiancé who's in the U.S. in an H-1B or in an F-1, excuse me, not an H-1B. You have a, a, someone who's here studying. They're on an F-1 visa or they're on a um, M-1 visa or perhaps they're here doing a training program in H-3 or they're on a TN short-term assignment, um, they, you're engaged, you, you travel frequently, um, you see each other in other countries, what have you, um, you actually want to go and be with them for the duration of their short-term assignment in the U.S. Say it's another year and a half. Well, that's a long time to be apart from a fiancé. So, of course, you want to go visit them. Uh, but you're not married yet, so how do you go and be with them uh, for that long, especially whenever the B-2 uh, is limited to the six months? Um, are you going to have to extend it the whole time you're there, like a cohabitating B-2 partner? Um, the answer is no. The B-2 fiancé of a non-immigrant who's currently in the U.S. is for individuals who will, once they have that visa annotated and get through CBP uh, with that visa, will marry their um, fiancé and immediately in change to that appropriate non-immigrant visa classification uh, dependent status. So uh, ch immediately intend to change to an F2, immediately intend to change to an H4, uh, immediately intend to change to a TD, uh, etc. So these are for individuals um, who actually do intend to come into the U.S. and change to something else. This is that one of those subsets of B, um, of specifically of B2, that your intent has to be to come get married and change to that subset. There are a few caveats in this that you uh, can't be coming to change to, say, um, the spouse of an H-1B who has an I-140 petition approved for them and is just about to become current. Those are big red flags, like I said, that uh, don't follow with the overall uh, primary purpose of the B-1, B-2 visas 
um, to facilitate short-term uh, legitimate travel. And if your short-term um, legitimate travel, uh, your, excuse me, the, the ability to, to be legitimate short-term travel means that you have non-immigrant intent, that you do not intend to, be, to become a permanent resident in the U.S. on that trip, uh, that your in, the intent is to return to that residence you have abroad that you have no intent of abandoning. Um, that being said, you know, some people are skeptical about whether or not these types of applications are possible and if the Department of State would approve them. The Department of State's mission, literally, is to facilitate legitimate um, travel to the U.S. Um, that is, their consular sections, their visa officers. Um, they want to facilitate the, you know, legitimate travel. They're not out to prevent everyone from coming to the U.S. Uh, they you know, will be aware of everything in your record, so it's important that you're absolutely forthcoming and um, truthful, because if you ever lie, that's a big fraud and misrep bar. But uh, importantly, you know, these subsets are possible, and they're done often. Um, and USCIS, excuse me, uh, the, the Department of State and Customs and Border Protection um, increasingly is becoming more familiar with the visa annotation process for these subsets. Um, and the ability to um, allow people to avail themselves of the benefits of these short-term subsets. Everyone's better off. So with that being said, um, I'm going to see if there are any questions, and with the limited time we have left, see which ones I can answer. So the first question I see here is, <clears throat> do you have any suggestions for B-2 applicants who are retired and the only, their only child is in the U.S.? How could they overcome the immigrant intent? That's a great question. So that fact pattern would, I'm assuming you also mean, uh, you know, an adult child, someone who's over 21 who's in the U.S. If they try to apply for a B-2 visa, and the visa officer or Customs and Border Protection, even if they have the visa, comes to learn of their, and they would in the visa application process, comes to learn of their relative, immediate relative in the U.S., um, excuse me, how could they overcome the immigrant intent? Well, the factors that I mentioned before of, do you have a residence abroad? You have no intent of abandoning. So they're retired, and let's say they're retired in, in Spain or Japan, um, they want to get a B-2 visa for whatever reason to come to the U.S. The officer will want to see, number one, do you have an actual residence, that means an abode, a physical place that you dwell, that you can access all the time, meaning you don't rent it out, you don't <clears throat> just have a storage unit that you call with a mailbox that you call your residence that you actually have a physical place that you stay and can go back to whenever you need to, but more specifically, intend to return to. Um, if you're retired, perhaps you have a, um, you, you probably are doing something with your life. It not, might not be a job and you might not be able to get the, the work letter, but maybe you have some friends or an association you belong to um, that could vouch for your um, strong ties in your um, home area in Spain or Japan. Similarly, you know, you're going to want to be able to demonstrate that you have the financial capacity to be able to support yourself while you're in the U.S., that you won't become a public burden. Um, so you would want to show things like uh, bank accounts, uh, retirement accounts, uh, retirement account disbursements, um, etc. The invitation letter to come perhaps from your, uh, your child in the U.S. Um, is nice to say, yes, they're coming to visit us or they're coming to stay with us for a few months. Um, however, they will absolutely be returning uh, to their place abroad. Um, you know, should the worst occur, I would, of course, you know, help them take care of themselves, but they can take care of themselves enough. Um, it's all a matter of what you can provide. So if, if you are a retiree, um, in one of those countries I just mentioned, and you want to get that visa to come to the U.S. To, to see, say, your grandkids or 
even just your adult children, um, to the extent that you can still show that intent to return to that residence abroad, great. If not, um, then you're going to run into problems. Similarly, if they believe that you're just going to, you know, pack up your bags, like if you show up with the, the, the old joke of like 20 steamer trunks uh, and you're coming to, for the U.S. for quote-unquote two weeks, um, that's not going to fly. Um, so just, just I think it's more of a real, to, to think about it in terms of what is reasonable, what is realistic. USCIS, um, our people, <laughs> excuse me, I keep saying USCIS, the visa office at the embassies and consulates and CBP are people too, and they have a sense of what is reasonable and what is not as well. Um, I hope that helped answer. Let's see, next question. Um, can TNs and E-visas uh, file for adjustment of status while in the U.S.? So if a person is here in the U.S. Um, and that person is on an E, say, 2 um, treaty um, investor visa, or a TN um, to uh, from Mexico um, on, or say as an engineer. Um, can they file for an adjustment of status while in the U.S.? Um, sure, if as long as their intent upon entry was valid. Um, if their intent upon entry was um, to come in and adjust status, um, that might be shady and might not be permissible. Um, it depends on the facts of the situation. Um, TNs and, and TN2 visa holders and E2 visa holders, for example, and um, to a, a limited extent the E3 visa holders from Australia, these are, um, these are not dual intent visas. You have to establish that you have um, no intention of, of becoming permanent residents in the U.S. upon that entry, um, similarly, um, for the E-2, that you will depart the U.S. upon the conclusion of your E-2 stay in the U.S. Uh, for the E-3, that you have that, um, you know, you have that home that you're going to return to, and the same for the TN-2. Let's see, other question. For someone who has a 10-year B-2 visa expiring in 2015 and comes from, S from ESTA approved country, which would you suggest they use? They would be visiting family and their B-2 visa stamp is in an expired passport. Do they need a return ticket in hand if traveling on a B-2? The, the last question, yes, you need a return ticket in hand if you're traveling to the U.S. on a B-2 or B-1 visa. Uh, you need a, a return ticket home, evidence that you're going to depart um, on, that, on a plane um, before the end of your stay, um, not that you're just going to you know, drive across the border. Um, they would be visiting family and their B-2 visa stamps and expired passport. Uh, you have to bring both passports to them. Um, if, you have a, if you have a B-2 visa folio in a passport and that's your old passport, you can still use it if it still has a valid expiration date as long as you have a current passport. Uh, you just bring both of them with you. Um, for someone who has a 10-year B visa. So if it's expiring in 2015, you're coming from an ESTA-approved country, um, what would I suggest? that you use, you know, it really does depend. Um, ESTA is the easiest and fastest way to facilitate short-term legitimate travel between the U.S. and, uh, or rather from the, the countries that are approved for it and the U.S. Um, specifically for, you know, things that I would say are, are more streamlined or general or, you know, uh, commonly um, used um, reasons for coming to the U.S. You know, you're coming into the U.S. literally for a week-long series of meetings in Atlanta. Well, if you are ESTA certified already, um, if you have the choice between you know, using your ESTA certification and applying for, say, a B-1, B-2 visa, the path of least resistance would be, since that's your, your easiest thing to do, um, would be to just use your ESTA, but if you are already have a B-2 visa and you're not ESTA certified already, um, you know, it's really up to you. If you're coming for the, just those short-term meetings, um, you know, you would, but, oh, I see also, too, the question is if it's just a B-2 visa, 
and you're coming for the, the uh, those type of business meetings, you know, maybe you want to just sign up for ESTA if you're eligible because your visa is specifically a just B2, not for B1 business. Um, if you had a B1, B2, you know, the B1 slash 2 10-year visa, um, it might just be all things being, e uh, everything else being equal, use that visa. Um, I hope that wasn't too long wind of an answer for you. And let's see, I have two minutes left. Um, look through here really quickly. What do you do with a parent who wants to place her young child in school, grade school, um, as a student, and therefore also wants to stay here to look after the child? Can she or he stay here as a visitor while the child attends school using a student visa? In other words, how is it for a parent to stay here during each school year um, while the child attends school? That is a very uh, good question. So if, if, a, if, a, if a child is coming to the U.S. to engage in a um, full course of study and they're coming uh, to do so on, say, an F1 visa, um, and the parent wants to come and visit them while they're there, uh, since the requirements for the B and the F um, are somewhat similar in that you have to have that residence abroad, you have no intent of abandoning, and uh, you have to be able to support yourself while here, you have to have non-immigrant intent. Um, if you can show, for example, that this period of short-term study in the U.S. is in fact short-term, like a study abroad program at a you know primary or secondary level, uh, maybe like a letter from a school um, from your home country saying like, yep, they're, they got into that program, they're coming back, um, you know, they're, they'll be back whenever he, that child is in eighth grade. Um, the B2 parent uh, upon entry will only get six months. And regardless of how long the um, academic program is for that child, uh, the B2 is only granted in two, excuse me, in, the B2 entry will only be granted in six month increments. So either departing and coming back or filing extension after extension after extension um, would have to be the proper method. Uh, I apologize for having to cut short. Um, thank you very much all for your attention, time, and questions. Um, if you have any more questions or if I did not answer your question, please email me at the email address on the screen, which I just erased. There it is. Um, at jshepard at wolfsdorf.com. You can also visit our website and click around uh, for other webinars on this topic and uh, upcoming ones and previous ones we have on there, um, as well as our articles. Thank you very much, and have a great day.